hello. Uh, please join us in worship. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on the Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun, oh, we look to the sun. the speed of life, freedom, shaking up the atmosphere, as the shadows fade into nothing as the day appears, beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our lights on the Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. The kingdom come. See the hope of heaven shining like the rising sun. Now forever, lifting up from death to life. There's no fear in love and no darkness in his endless light. Beyond the skies of Reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on the Savior, see the image of love, sing his praises forever. joining us. Um, we're so happy that you can st still be with us, um, even if it's online. Um, we just ask that you would comment, um, say hi to each other, um, and just fellowship, even if it's over your phones or your laptops or whatever. But we're going to keep singing, so if you would join us in worship.
You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child.
in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debtors, as we f forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome everybody out there, too. For those who have joined us, uh, we're glad. Well, let's just be true. I miss everybody. We all, I think even talking on behalf of the worship team, we miss you guys. But the day is coming soon where we're going to start gathering back together again. More on that in just a moment because I need to also welcome our guests. To our guests, maybe this is the first time you've connected with Westview or maybe uh, you've been hanging with us for a few weeks. We're glad you're here. My name is Brian. I'm our lead pastor. And I, this is something for our guests that's really important to us is that if you're on our webpage, there is a link right below that video screen you're watching that is a connect card. We would love if you just take 10 seconds, fill that out so we know who you are until we can actually gather together again. Also, that is also on our Facebook Live. You'll see it posted there in the comments. Uh, you can connect to there also. But for the rest of our whole church, please use that Connect card to reach out to us with anything that you want to praise God about or any prayer requests that you need because we still love praying for you, praying with you, praising with you every day. So use that Connect link to do that. Uh, before we jump into the sermon, tell you a couple things. One is that video you just watched is an announcement called Focus 2020. It is our vacation Bible school experience this summer. And so let me make sure I get this right with some of this information. This is our first announcement of it. Uh, this is really cool. This summer, our elementary, first through sixth grade, if I remember right, yeah, July 6th through the 10th, that it's going to look a little different this year. Um, it is going to be a very safe format. Our Vacation Bible School Week will be filled with high energy lessons, awesome crafts, crazy games, prepackaged snacks. There's all these things we're doing as we gather to be safer, um, but you won't have to leave your neighborhood and you can even invite your neighbors to join you. What is that about? Well, there's a link to register your child. It's available on our Church Center app. It'll be also in our email newsletter. Uh, it's on our Facebook page, and I bet you're gonna see it right here in our live stream video comments that you can link and find more information, and we'll continue to talk a lot more about that. The other announcement is um, that our in-person 
gathering that I mentioned will start, if everything stays on target, uh, will start June 21st, Sunday, Father's Day. Uh, this is going to be a, a safe place. We're going through a lot of work. You should see how big our list is of things to get ready for you to start gathering with us. But it will be a safe environment. There's going to be a video coming out here in a short while, in a few days, that will talk about what to expect when you gather back. The service times will be different because we're going to have a lot, probably less people and volunteers initially. And we know many of you are excited to come back and many of you are hesitant right now as we're kind of seeing how everything plays out. And that's okay because we're not only going to be reaching the people in here, we're still going to reach and connect with you uh, online so we're going to have two audiences to work with until this all settles out so but we're excited about that i miss you we all miss you do you know who i miss the most my wife i have not worshiped with her in 10 or 12 weeks now and it's like i miss my wife um, so I'm looking forward to gathering too and actually worshiping and celebrating with her. But there's something else I miss and that's why I talked about you guys and my wife first uh, is baseball. I really miss baseball, but you know it's my priorities. Uh, I have this baseball app. I love it. It's, uh, I listen to about all 164 baseball games of my team, the Cleveland Indians, every summer. It's right there on my phone and it gives me alerts. It tells me uh, that, hey, the game's about ready to start and all that, but it has been quiet, right? It has been quiet this whole year. And uh, so I'm waiting for that app to come back alive. But there's something else that's really neat that this app does that I get really excited about is it will give me an alert when there is a perfect game in progress. And it only happens about two, three times a year. It gives the alert about the sixth or seventh inning of the game and said, hey, there's a guy pitching a perfect game and I will jump over to that radio broadcast and listen because it is such a rare event. I want to take you back 10 years ago this week to a perfect game that was being pitched. I want, I want, I'm going to put a video up here. This is actually a guy pitching a perfect game against my team, the Cleveland Indians. I remember this game really well, but it had a very different ending. So let's go look at what's happening in the bottom of the ninth in one of the most rare things you see in baseball, the perfect game. Watch this. And a swing and a high fly ball toward left center field. Jackson is on the run, still going. He the catch! Oh, Jackson! Austin Jackson in left center field. A sparkling play. Here's the one-two. Bouncing ball to short. Santiago, and there are two outs. Six up, 26 down. Here comes number 27. It's Jason Donald and a crowd of better than 17,000 to its feet. The guy we've been waiting for all night. Ground ball, right side. Cabrera will cut it off. Galarraga covers. He's out. No, oh, he's safe. He is safe. safe at first base. You make the call. Cabrera, Galarraga. Did he miss the base? He's out. Why is he safe? He must have missed. I don't know, Rod. I, I'm, I don't know how to describe this. I just feel so bad for Armando Galarraga. What an effort tonight for Armando. Ten years ago this week, Armando Galarraga was throwing the perfect game. And you just watched the ninth thing down to the very last batter. He had a 3-1 count, a routine grounder to first. The ba first baseman rushes out, gets it. Armando covers the base. Here's the throw, and he's safe. It, or it's out, right? You're thinking he's out. It's the perfect game. But it's not. Jim Joyce, veteran Major League umpire, walks in. He's safe. The problem in 2010 is that while there's instant replay, you couldn't use it for review. And they watched the review, and he was clearly safe. The perfect game is now not perfect. The perfection of man is taken out by the imperfection of man. What's interesting is a short while later, Armando Galarraga, the pitcher, and Jim Joyce, the veteran umpire, would write a book together. It's titled this, Nobody's Perfect. 
Two men, one call, and a game for baseball history. The definition, for those of you maybe who aren't as familiar with baseball, the definition of a perfect game in baseball is a minimum, uh, the pitcher faces a minimum of three batters in each inning. Three batters, three outs, nine innings. Nobody gets on base. Nobody scores. 27 batters come up. 27 batters go down. It's a perfect game. To give you an idea why it's so big, in 150 years of professional baseball in the major leagues, there has been over 218,000 games. 218,000 games, and only 23 have been a perfect game. It's a big deal. So here's a trivia for those, especially on Facebook Live. If you're not on Facebook Live, shout out in the living room. Can you tell me the last year that there was a perfect game? Guess, don't Google. The last year, it's longer, it's, it's a lot longer than you think, I bet. The last year, on Facebook Live, just write it there, write it right on there, Say, hey, this is what it is. Maybe the first person, I will drive to their house and give them a candy bar. Um, just because I love seeing people. Uh, not to, but yeah, the last year there was actually a perfect game. And we'll get that answer later if I remember. So what, is that, what lesson does that video kind of tell us? That video, watching that perfect game become imperfect, reminds us that being perfect is impossible. Being perfect is impossible. But that's not what Jesus tells us. So I want to welcome you to the second week of our sermon series, this whole summer series called Bring the Heat. For this month, we're, we're talking about these things that Jesus says, where he brings the heat, the hard sayings of Jesus that we find in the Bible. And last week, we talked about Jesus really brought the heat when he said, let the, bury, let the dead bury the dead. And we really went deep into what that all meant. You can check that out on our, on, our, on our website or you can look at our YouTube channel and catch up on that. But this week, here's our first note together. This is where Jesus brings the heat. When he says, hashtag, you are to be perfect. Did you just take a big breath? Because I did. I, think, I, mean, I mean, we love Jesus, right? I mean, he is our all in all. But did he just give us a command? You must be perfect. Did he just give us a command for something that is humanly impossible? I mean, we look at that and we say, hey, probably in the context he didn't mean it was that hyperbole we talked about last week, or maybe it's just an exaggeration to make a point. Because seriously, as a lead pastor for five and a half years, this is what I have observed in, in those years. I have observed there is no perfect church, there is no perfect congregation size, there is no perfect theology. There is no perfect coffee that suits everybody on Sunday morning. There is no perfect worship style or songs. There is no perfect leadership style. There is no perfect communion wafer. There is no perfect pastor. There is no perfect sermon. Come on. Did Jesus really just say, be perfect? Yes, he did. Was it an exaggeration? No. So I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 48. This is the actual verse in short context. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 48. 48. And just hang out there with me for a little while. But here's what the actual verse says from the Bible. It says, but you are to be perfect. These are the words of Jesus. You are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So remember three rules last week we kind of talked about. When we look at, be careful of taking a single scripture. We always want to look at it in the context, the immediate context that we see at scripture. We want to see it in a larger context of the chapter in the book. We also want to see it in the whole reference of the character of Jesus, who he is, how it's described throughout the Bible. And we also want to see this single verse in the context of the entire scripture. What does the whole Bible say? How does it fit into that story? Does it contradict it or does it support it? So remember those three rules, and we're going to actually see these three rules applied throughout what we're talking about today. So being perfect, I know I'm still trying to get a breath about being perfect, or the phrase that we might use in our theology is Christian perfection, is a big challenge for us. There are a variety of viewpoints on what Christian perfection is, and it's a hard statement. There's a lot of argument about this. So what do we commonly do as Christians when we hear a hard saying of Jesus and we are all wrestling with it with different opinions is that we just don't talk about it, right? Well, until today, we're going to talk about it. I, I, think, I think the average Christian, sorry, for any of us who are really average, the average Christian struggles with perfection, 
because they commonly see it's something that they achieve. And so here's our next note together, is that perfection is not a trophy, it's oneness with God. Perfection is not a trophy. What that means is perfection is not something that we achieve, that we put up on a shelf to say, hey, look, I've made it. See my trophy, I'm perfect. But perfection is oneness with God. That's the whole picture of the Bible. God is holy and perfect. To be one with God forever in heaven, we too have to be perfect. So what's interesting, we look at the whole context of the Bible. The first two chapters of the Bible, we see the creation of man. Genesis chapter 1 and 2. You know what happens in 1 and 2? They are perfect. Humanity is perfect in chapters 1 and 2. Do you know when I look at the last two chapters of the Bible, the, the, this book of Revelation, which hasn't really happened yet or have been fully fulfilled, I look at the last two chapters of the Bible, 21 and 22, and humanity is and will be perfect. So between the last two chapters and the first two chapters, all this is imperfect. We're a mess in between those chapters. What messed up our perfection? Sin did. Sin is the obstacle to perfection. But in the middle of the Bible, God sent his son Jesus, who is perfect and remained perfect, to deal with our lack of perfection, our sin. So here's our next note together. Take another breath with me. Take a breath, you can't do it. Take a breath, I can't do it. Everyone take a breath. Christian perfection can never be human perfection. Take the pressure off, we can't do it. In and of ourselves, we can't make ourselves perfect. It's impossible. It is. On our own, when we go after perfection, it's usually driven by one of two things. It's driven by either pride, hey, look at me, I've arrived, and it's false, or it's driven by fear. The demands that other puts on us, the demands of ourselves, driven by fear that I won't live up to or please my father, my mother, my boss, my friend, my girlfriend, my spouse. Left to ourselves, perfection is a train wreck. And I want to take this pressure off of us forever, so let me start with how then. If Jesus commands us to be perfect, then how are we perfect? And so let's take a look at our next note together. Take a big breath this time, because Jesus already did it. Jesus already has made us perfect, at least in God's eyes. Jesus lived perfectly. He died and rose again for us. And in that act on the cross, he purchased our perfection. In God's eyes, because of what Jesus did on the cross through his death and resurrection, by birch, virtue, virtue, sorry, that's that word, by virtue of being joined to Jesus in faith, God now sees us as perfect, even though we're still sinners and imperfect. There's a fancy term used for this. It's called imputed, imputed perfection, or it's called conditional perfection. But let me break it down. For those who believe and follow Jesus, if we die today, God sees us as perfect through the cross. We stand before God because of the death and resurrection of Jesus accepted at that moment as one with him. And this is no more clearly explained in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 and 14. Let me share that with you. It says, but our high priest, which is referring to Jesus as a title, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. For by that one offering, he forever made Say that word with me. 
perfect. Those who are being made holy. Now that verse 14 is loaded. Jesus, through his love and sacrifice for his life on the cross, he made us perfect. It's very clear. Forever. Not just for a while. Forever. In God's eyes. But look at 14 as it continues on. He made us perfect for those who are being made holy. Being made holy means that we are maturing to be more like Jesus. We are heading towards perfection. So that sentence says it. It's a paradox. Because of Christ, we are already perfect in God's eyes, but it is shaping and forming those of us to be more like him, to be more perfect as we go through this life. So how? How, how is Jesus making us more holy, more like him each day? How is he moving us towards perfection? Oh, he has a helper. Here's our next note together. Take a long breath this time, for the Holy Spirit is doing it. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes us more holy. The Holy Spirit is his helper who's here with us today. God's presence inside of us, making us more like Jesus every day. The more we allow him to guide us and grow us, the more we become like Jesus every day, which is a step every day towards perfection. Perfection, ladies and gentlemen, this is so important. Perfection is not something we give up on as unachievable. It is a goal we should have every day. To not believe in perfection is to not believe in God's grace and power through the Holy Spirit to change us. We should strive for perfection every day as a realistic goal. And I look at this sometimes as, as a description once given to me, and it's like becoming more holy like Jesus, becoming less sinful, which makes me more perfect, is my relationship and my love with Jesus. It's like my relationship with my wife, 33 years of marriage. Every day my relationship with her grows stronger. I think I've done a really good job. I'm not the same guy I was 30 years ago and how I treated her. I've grown to love her more and more, which means that I sin against her more, less and less. Sorry. I grow closer to her. We become one. Our relationship gets stronger. It's the same way it is with Jesus. Our relationship grows every day. I value our relationship so much that sinning gets hard for me. I don't want to hurt that relationship. Jesus simplified the goal of perfection what it looks like for each of us in the great commandment. Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is perfection summarized in a grand commandment. Perfection is the Holy Spirit at work, Jesus' helper, filling our heart, soul, and mind to love God perfectly through what Jesus did, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Perfection every day is surrendering more and more of my spirit to the Holy Spirit, surrendering my mind, surrendering my heart, surrendering my soul, letting him fill that. And when I love God like that, and I love Jesus like that, and I love the Holy Spirit like that, that love spills out in perfection as a second part to others. Perfection is now seen in how we love not only God and a triune God in all three persons, but how we love others. So let me, let me kind of give you an analogy. Let's go back to baseball. We talked about what a perfect game looks like for a pitcher, but for more of us, I think we relate with the batter. What does a perfect game look like for a batter? And I think this helps us see perfection a little bit. If a batter goes up and gets a hit, every time they get a hit when they go up to bat and they get on base safely, if they do it every time, they are perfect. Now, bat... Baseball puts stats to everything. There's a percentage to that. It's called a batting average. If I get on base every single time, safely, every time I bat, I bat 1.000. 
perfect. So if I bat 100 times, I get on base 100 times safely. I'm perfect. But the reality is when you look at the best pros out there playing Major League Baseball today, they only get on base 20 to 30 times out of 100, and they are the best. So we put their percentages as .200 to .300. We say batting 200 or batting 300. The best bat around 300. So that means the best in baseball today get on base about three times out of 10, 30 times out of 100, 300 times out of 1,000. We call that the lifetime batting average. It's the composite of all the days of their lives playing baseball. So if you and I look at our lifetime batting average when it comes to sin and our relationship with God, um, you know, we might all be at different places, but we know we're not perfect, right? But what we really pay attention to in baseball is in one game, a batter will go up to bat on average four times in one game, one nine-inning game. And it is possible that day, and it happens, that the batter that day will go up to bat four times and they will get on base four times. They will have a perfect day. So what if our faith was like that? What if perfection is not about our lifetime average, but about our batting today? What if our focus is on our day, our focus is on my whole heart, soul, and mind with God today, loving Him, even for half a day, that gives me a perfect half day. If I love God with my whole heart, soul, and mind, and I love my neighbors, myself, today for a whole day, which is not unachievable, I have a perfect day. The best way to think about this is at night when I go to bed, I commonly do a prayer reflection. I look up to God and say, how did we do today? And every once in a while, I look back over my day and say, God, we had a really good day. I don't think I can think of a time I was outside your will. I was purposely rebellious. It doesn't happen that often with me, but it's possible in a day I went four for four. And I smile to God to say, we had a good day together. And he grows me in my maturity he grows me in that movement another step towards perfection. He shapes me through his spirit more like Jesus. Some people are so hung up on I can't be perfect. Then let me remind you of a famous quote by Zig Ziglar, big business guy, speaker. He says, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And I believe the same thing comes to perfection. If we aim at it, watch what the Holy Spirit can do. It's about the journey. It's not always about the results. So how do we know we're becoming more perfect? How do we know we're becoming more like Jesus? How do we know we're growing in spiritual perfection? Well, let me wrap up by going back to where we took that verse today, and let me expand out, again, the immediate context around the verse of Jesus saying, you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Here's the context around what Jesus said. Matthew 5, starting in verse 43. Jesus says, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even the pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Oh boy, look at the beautiful framework we have here. In the immediate context, Jesus is actually summarizing chapter five. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we're kind of like dealing with the first number of things that Jesus dealt with and showing how we're to grow in our Christian maturity. And he says this, you know, verse 48, my favorite word you guys know is but, but you are to be perfect. He says you're not to be like other people. You're to be perfect, like your father is perfect. And when you look at the whole chapter five, he's summarizing the whole chapter five. He, Jesus has said, 
You be the salt and the light. You obey the law. Look at being careful about anger. He went over divorce. He went over adultery. He went over vows. He went over revenge. And he summarizes it all right here in 43 through 48. The whole chapter is summarized. Jesus says, you want to do this right? You want to be salt and light? You want to be law? You want to be within the law? You want to not be angry? The issues with divorce? You want to do all these? He summarized it with how we love. This is how you're perfect. It's seen in how you love. He is talking about perfection, not only how we love God first, but others second. And he says really hard and in your face, not loving only those who love us, but love those who hate you, love those who persecute you, love those outside your circle of friends and your family. Our last note together, I think I could summarize what Jesus is trying to say is perfection cannot be hidden. It is visible and it is seen in how we love. Why is this so important right now? Well, ladies and gentlemen, there is a world outside and even inside our church, people that are hurting today like no other time in recent history. I'm seeing something I've never seen in my life with loss of jobs, sickness, fear, rioting, murder, shouts of systemic racism. I get the questions this week, Brian, what should our church be doing? My answer is the same thing we ask of the church every day, to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And to go into the world and love them Love the hard to love, love the broken, love the hurting, love my neighbor, including my black neighbor, my Hispanic neighbor, my Asian neighbor, and my white neighbor. Love those that are poor, love those who are rich. Love my gay neighbor, love my lonely widowed neighbor, love my lost neighbor who does not know Jesus. The world will be a better place when we go out there swinging for the fence in love. One person at a time, the whole church in operation. My fear is times like these where we look at the virus and look at what's going on as the church actually retreats inside of itself. They're more worried about getting back together to worship or doing things like this than worrying about we have the richest audience to share the good news of Jesus Christ with right now in front of us. And we cannot miss this opportunity. So church, let me encourage you, step up to bat. Go four for four today. Let the Spirit empower you. Chase perfection in how we love. You want to know that trivia answer now? When was the last time that a perfect game was thrown in the major leagues? It was 2012, eight years ago. But I want you to write down this date. I want my phone to shoot me this alert that on June 7th, 2020, today is the day that God's children had a perfect day. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we uh, praise you for the hard words of Jesus that are recorded in this scripture. We praise you that, that you've given us a spirit not of fear and timidity, but a spirit that is bold to take on the hard things of Jesus. Father, I know many of us wrestle with the concept of perfection. But it is truth that Jesus, for those who follow and love him, have already made us perfect in God's eyes. But he's also taken us on a journey through his Holy Spirit, making us perfect every day. It is achievable. It is something we have to have in front of us and it is something we should pursue every day and it will be seen in how we love. And this world right now really needs a church that will cross all the lines and the boundaries and the cultural barriers and love. Father, empower your church today to not become selfish during all this time. We are going to gather. We will always be, we're always moving forward to help us go out and love right now in those hard places. Father, our offering first is to examine our own lives. Are we being safe with our love or are we being a church that really loves?
that is what Westview is, and that is what Christ's church is. Encourage us to cross boundaries this week because we will change this nation and this world by showing Christ's love, and he will perfect us. Father, our other gift to you is the giving of the church because our mission is, is even ramped up even more. Our church has been faithful. They have been giving, and please continue this summer to give consistently, faithfully, and most importantly, joyfully. Father, I pray for the church as we prepare to gather again to keep us safe. Father, we praise you for the new baby girl to Justin and Lene Martini, our creative arts director here. Um, praise you for this team that holds the fort while they're gone. We praise the, pray for you that, that, that just the next six to eight weeks, their life is beautiful with their new little daughter. Protect them also. Father, rise up your church and your spirit. Let us go out in love. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us in this last song that we're going to do. Let's sing about who God says we are. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I Yes.
guys so much for joining us today. Make sure you come back next week and we can all see each other again. Have a good week. <laughs>